Welcome back, guys. We're going to move ahead now with uh, another abstract expressionist, uh, Helen Frankenthaler. You know, I'm just noticing here on this page that that's not exactly the order that our course and exam description goes in. And it shows you kind of the detriment to following that as an absolute timeline, because in all honesty, pop art is going to come to the fore much later. Um, than the works that we know from color fields. So I'm going to try and go in order uh, to make a, like a continuous uh, narrative here for you about how things change over time rather than the dates that they show up in the course and exam description. Um, so um, we've talked about abstract expressionism. Let's go back to our timeline here and take just a quick look at where we're headed next. If I use my laser pointer here, I can kind of show you where we've been. With AbX, we've been all over the world of gestural abstract expressionism, <clears throat> where you see the drips and the drops and the brush strokes of people like Pollock and de Kooning. Um, for this arm of abstract expressionism, we're going to let the color do a little bit more of the expressing for us. And that's where you get into chromatic um, expressionism. Um, Rothko and his contemporaries like Barnett Newman um, basically would talk about the psychological aspects of color as being the primal thing you would respond to, to kind of like take the artist out of the equation and let the color do all of the heavy lifting. Um, you can see that Helen Frankenthaler is going to go on beyond that with something that's called post-painterly abstraction, where you really try to diminish the presence of the artist in the viewer's mind. And you do that a couple of different ways, either color field like Morris Lewis and Helen Frankenthaler or hard edge color um, where you work just in the primacy of the, the contemporary colors like uh, Kelly and Stella. So I'm mean, just like with um, uh, Willem de Kooning, you really can't understand the artist unless you understand what's going on around the time period to them directly. So I need to kind of walk you through these movements, even though they're not on the exam, you'll see that Frankenthaler is kind of like, um, the end game here. So we're making our way down from abstract expressionism, which was heavily influential on her, um, to what we will call her post painterly abstraction and color field. Um, so let's get rid of that laser pointer um, now that we know where we're headed and let's start talking about the artwork itself. Now, some of you are familiar with this artwork because you've already done like a concept map on it. Um, everyone uh, uh, that's looked at the list knows that the title of the thing is The Bay, but I'm not sure that the artist started out with that kind of imagery in her mind. This is this is very experiential. And when artists like she and Jackson Pollock begin their paintings, they don't really have you know, knowledge of what the title will be. As a matter of fact, we're getting to the period of time where most artists are simply going to call their works untitled to, to stop having people make those associations before they take a chance and look at the process and the art. So um, she, like Jackson Pollock, who she visited and studied and worked with alongside, um, uh, was basically impressed by the um, performance aspect of what he was doing on the floor. She was enamored of the fact that sometimes little happy accidents would occur during the midst of the performance and that that process gave the pigment a larger role to play if you simply allowed yourself not to try to even have a goal in mind. Um, now, of course, she's choosing the colors that respond to landscape. We see greens, we see blues, and it looks like there's a hovering body of water. Um, we see a little isthmus sticking out. That's a little tip of brown. That could be um, a, a, a riverbank kind of thing or jetty. And then we see a, a flat horizontal thing that could be a road by this body of water. Um, that's all, you know, assumption. Um, please don't let that sway you. Um, essentially, what's exciting about this is the process. So let's go into this a little bit more in detail. Um, in terms of what was going on with chromatic post-war expressionism, some of you have asked me about uh, Mark Rothko, and this is where he fits. Um, he and Barnett Newman would completely abstract away from all color. This work is called uh, The Triumphant Man. And and there's not much narrative to go on here. There's some vertical lines on a field of red, 
Um, Newman would talk about this artwork as if the little lines represented humans and their humanity trying to hold back a big red wall that was simply dwarfing them and absorbing them. So these guys really wanted big universal themes and ideas to be relevant for their artworks to make sense, and they wanted to overwhelm you. And this is when the canvases start to get super large. You're supposed to stand in front of things like this and simply be totally overwhelmed and consumed by the color. There's Barnett Newman um, there with Jackson Pollock. So it's kind of hard to split these out as like different time periods that were sequential. It's kind of like all this stuff was going on at the same time. They just have different variations of how to interpret that abstraction. So this is all happening in the 1950s and the 1960s. Here is Mark Rothko. Um, for those of you that know him from the Tony Award winning show on Broadway, uh, Red, um, you know that this is not a happy story. It's it's a triumphant story in the themes that Rothko tries to express in his art, but it doesn't have a happy ending. And I'll let you find out more about that later. Um, he basically comes up with this idea that mixing the colors together doesn't let them really have their full effect. And flattening them out is not a way to go either. He takes large canvases and a large paintbrush and basically builds up the color in horizontal swaths um, where the real exciting part of the painting is right in between the two colors that don't overlap. It's kind of like um, an amorphous landscape or place that you're supposed to walk into. And if you watch the Simon Shama video on this guy, he tells you exactly how you're supposed to experience them about 18 inches away from the canvas in a room that's dimly lit and you'll begin to see if you stay there long enough these colors seem to recede and advance and take on like a breathy movement um, it's a visual effect that's quite minimal at best and people often stand here going what am i looking at but the idea is that it's supposed to to connote a mood that takes over depending on the colors that are used so um, you have to see these things lit perfectly for that effect to take place, but it really is something that's striking as, as getting at the universal you know, qualities of humanity that's not representational, but it's given over to like color, um, emotive color qualities, right? Um, he felt like he was misunderstood, and I guess you can see why there on the floor you see the marking where you're supposed to stand. Um, on the right, you see works that he put into um, the Tate Gallery in uh, London. Um, but basically, um, he, his, his commanding work was the Seagram's Commission, and that's the subject of the Simon Shama video. I really think that's worthwhile um, if you're trying to understand Mark Rothko and this kind of expressionistic uh, art. Um, the post-painterly abstraction guys really wanted to remove the brushstrokes that we're seeing in the chromatic ab X and in the gestural ab X. They wanted to go hard edge. Um, Ellsworth Kelly started his process by taking individual canvases and covering them in a primary color. He would then abut the canvases side by side by side to see what the colors would do to each other. And then he started just painting that way. So here's his composition, blue, green, red pretty straightforward. You realize that narrative is not the point. It is exploring color harmony. And this is kind of what Frankenthaler is doing. She's doing it in a different kind of way, but <clears throat> this is definitely just as valid. Here's Ellsworth Kelly in his studio. And you guys might recognize um, this from the Gardner's textbook, Red, Green, Blue. Um, so we're playing with primary colors, very much like his, his uh, forebears, Kandinsky. Uh, Mondrian. It's just we basically have an overwhelming kind of connection to, between the colors that you're only made aware of when you're standing in front of the canvases. Um, this is his red square. That's a work at the DMA. And if you guys have been to the modern lately, you probably have seen his large wall hanging commissions that kind of make an icon out of the painting canvas and make it something um, that's more of an object rather than a flat two-dimensional um, um, thing, right? It basically takes on a different kind of life. There are no frames on his artworks because the edges are part of the composition. And it gives you kind of a different approach to color that you're supposed to lose yourself in. Um, Frank Stella, known for his rather reductive lines, um, started out in a monochromatic black and white, um, basically painting all of these lines by hand to see what they would do when spaces were left in between. That idea, guys, came from Matisse and his reverse contour lines where he left fields of color 
just barely touching each other or with a little white space in between. And it's generated artists like Mark Rothko and Frank Stella to take that a little bit further with abstraction. Um, sometimes the, the effect follows the shape of the canvas and tries to create a dazzling effect that's more like a visual poem. Um, sometimes he would build canvases in this protractor series that he came up with um, looks um, like a ge geometry experiment, right? Um, where the colors um, don't really overlap. Um, they're flat fields of color that follow the shape of the canvas. Here, um, this work is called Suleiman the Magnificent, and it does kind of look like an Islamic uh, artwork where you see repetitive forms that go different directions and shapes, but overall create a geometry that is mesmerizing. Um, so you get a variety of different interpretations with hard edge. Now, Helen Frankenthaler is really color field. So she is going to take Jackson Pollock's instruction and take it one further by not using brushes, by not using um, sticks to drip these on. She's going to pour the acrylic right onto the unprimed canvas. She will allow the color to pool in places. So that's where we get these dark areas of dark, rich color. And then she'll allow it to, to drain through, tilting the canvas, which is unstretched, on not on a frame, moving the paint and letting it be the happy accident that decides the composition that it wants to be. So um, in this, this is one of her first where she didn't really let the colors overlap. She wanted them to retain their like immediacy and purity by not having everything kind of become washed out. And um, it's one of her pivotal pieces. It's a large canvas. It's about seven feet by seven feet. So a very large square. You're supposed to feel as if you're standing in front of a landform. And that's that's essentially what she talked about when this, this was uh, uh, initiated. On Khan Academy, they mentioned her earlier work, Mountains and Sea. And you can see there's a lot of overlap here and stuff that looks like accidental. Like if you had you know moved one line or one field of color, the composition wouldn't exist. Um, in the future, this might show up as an, an attribution, but it's earlier and it predates the bay. So I've got some others I'd like to show you. Um, this, you can kind of see, it's unprimed canvas. She doesn't put gesso on it for a white background because she's not really trying to make the colors pop. She wants them to go into the canvas and she wants them to sit on top of the canvas depending on how she pours the piece. There she is as the young artist in the 1950s in a magazine article where she was featured. She represents the feminine voice in a field of male um, counterparts and is one of the few females during this time who has significant success with this particular style. Um, for Helen Frankenthaler, she wasn't trying to get at, you know, the big issues of life, um, the universal concerns of humanity, like a Mark Rothko or a Barnett Newman. And she wasn't really trying to make a hard art like Jackson Pollock or Willem de Kooning that seemed aggressive and, and like vengeful uh, with the canvas. She wanted to make something that was more poetic. Um, more of like an homage to an idea rather than a fully formed narrative or story. Um, so you, you get even more abstraction, more of an absence of the brushwork, but you're definitely in the midst of a performance artist who's trying to, to emote with you. Um, here she is pouring um, more uh, stain on canvas. She would take her acrylic paints uh, with the bay and she would thin them out or thicken them up, um, trying to create you know, variations of the same color. And she would let the artwork come to life in a performance that she did. She said standing on the canvas, she felt like she had way more control over the consistency, the viscosity of the paint um, and, and uh, not be tied to an easel making a small little pretty picture. She wanted to go big um, and she did with her large uh, compositions. Here you can see her pouring a large amount of stain right in the same place to get a different effect than what you see on the right, spreading the ink and the, the acrylic around. So um, it is an interesting process and you have to realize that that is what art is becoming. It's becoming a way to manipulate the elements of art and principles of design to come up with a visual stimulator. Um, it is not really art that tells a story. It, it's all about, you know, reduction of the story, reduction of the figure to get at the basic principles of art. 
Um, some people would call this esoteric art that was really, you know, for people who knew art well and, and could enjoy it in the galleries. And people were going, hey, where's the beef? I need to see a story here. Um, so we're going to talk very shortly about a rise in a new form of art called pop art, where people begin to see things they recognize being used over and over and over. Um, if you had to talk about influences with Helen Frankenthaler, I would hope that you would remember in the Khan Academy article, they talked about a male version of Helen Frankenthaler, who was kind of a contemporary of hers, Morris Lewis. Um, he too would pour uh, paint across unprimed canvas and let it run. He would tilt his canvases and let the paint run down um, the canvas. You can kind of see what he's doing here by pouring the paint. Um, these little flat lines show you where the paint first made uh, contact with the canvas and then it runs all the way down and through, eventually kind of running out of steam there. Um, here, he's using inks rather than paint, and you get a very different kind of gauzy uh, effect where you can see the paint cans, uh, where they poured out, and then how the colors blended. He calls this CeraBand. So um, it's kind of like, you know, the impression that you get after the work is done, you add the title and it becomes, you know, like a visual pun sort of, but it heavily reminds me of Song Su Nam, uh, the artist that we looked at in the fall. Uh, his, his work, Summer Trees, was done similarly with the different media with ink on paper rather than canvas. And you can see the process is basically the same, right? If you turn this upside down, you can see the brush strokes started at the top. Um, came all the way down until the, the brush ran out of ink or hit the edge. And then he pops in those little tree trunks there to call um, up in mind those, those summer trees. But similar process, different time period. He was working in the 1980s in um, South Korea. Um, this work is at the um, uh, Fort Worth Modern, and it's called Canyon. It is super huge. And it uses Morris Lewis's um, iconic dripping method, but it creates visual imagery where we feel like we're going into that expansive space, very much like Frankenthaler, um, who, who does other works. Here's Canyon. And you get the sense that the colors of the desert are being engaged to give us a sense of a large flat field that we're supposed to kind of walk into. Um, you have her desert pass, which looks very much like a Georgia O'Keeffe rendering of landscape, um, but it's all completely abstract. And of course, whether this works for you, the viewer, that's, that's basically up to you. And it gives you a larger role as a viewer where you have to become part of the process. You have to be willing to not be entertained. You have to think quietly and sort of meditate. And that's, that's the effect that a lot of her later works have on the viewer. They're almost meditative um, um, in, in the way that they compel us to look deeply. So um, as far as um, narrative, you're not gonna get that with Frankenthaler, but what you will get is a wonderful exploration of process that seems almost ethereal and, and transcendental. And um, I think she would be happy with those kinds of definitions. So um, we will move on to pop art in just a second.